Chapter Twenty Nine of the Mystery of the Yellow Room. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mystery of the Yellow Room by Gaston Leroux. Chapter Twenty Nine. The Mystery of Mademoiselle Stangerson. During the days that followed I had several opportunities to question him as to his reason for his voyage to America, but I obtained no more precise answers than he had given me on the evening of the adjournment of the trial, when we were on the train for Paris. One day, however, on my still pressing him, he said, "'Can't you understand that I had to know Larson's true personality?' "'No doubt,' I said. "'But why did you go to America to find that out?' He sat smoking his pipe and made no further reply. I began to see that I was touching on the secret that concerned Mademoiselle Stangerson. Rouletabille evidently had found it necessary to go to America to find out what the mysterious tie was that bound her to Larson by so strange and terrible a bond. In America he had learned who Larson was, and had obtained information which closed his mouth. He had been to Philadelphia. And now what was this mystery which held Mademoiselle Stangerson and Monsieur Robert Darzac in so inexplicable a silence. After so many years, and the publicity given the case by a curious and shameless press, now that M. Stangerson knows all, and has forgiven all, all may be told. In every phase of this remarkable story, Mademoiselle Stangerson has always been the sufferer. The beginning dates from the time when, as a young girl, she was living with her father in Philadelphia. A visitor at the house, a Frenchman, had succeeded by his wit, grace, and persistent attention in gaining her affections. He was said to be rich, and had asked her of her father. M. Stangerson, on making inquiries as to M. Jean Roussel, found that the man was a swindler and an adventurer. Jean Roussel was but another of the many names under which the notorious Ballmeyer, a fugitive from France, tried to hide himself. M. Stangerson did not know of his identity with Ballmeyer. He learned that the man was simply undesirable for his daughter. He not only refused to give his consent to the marriage, but denied him admission into the house. Mathilde Stangerson, however, had fallen in love. To her, Jean Roussel was everything that her love painted him. She was indignant at her father's attitude, and did not conceal her feelings. Her father sent her to stay with an aunt in Cincinnati. There she was joined by Jean Roussel, and in spite of the reverence she felt for her father, ran away with him to get married. They went to Louisville, and lived there for some time. One morning, however, a knock came at the door of the house in which they were, and the police entered to arrest Jean Roussel. It was then that Mathilde Stangerson, or Roussel, learned that her husband was no other than the notorious Ballmeyer. The young woman in her despair tried to commit suicide. She failed in this, and was forced to rejoin her aunt in Cincinnati. The old lady was overjoyed to see her again. She had been anxiously searching for her, and had not dared to tell M. Stangerson of her disappearance. Mathilde swore her to secrecy, so that her father should not know that she had been away. A month later, Mademoiselle Stangerson returned to her father, repentant, her heart dead within her, hoping only one thing, that she would never again see her husband, the horrible Ballmeyer. A report was spread, a few weeks later, that he was dead, and she now determined to atone for her disobedience by a life of labor and devotion for her father, and she kept her word. All this she had confessed to Robert Darzac, and believing Ballmeyer dead, had given herself to the joy of a union with him. But fate had resuscitated Jean Roussel, the Ballmeyer of her youth. He had taken steps to let her know that he would never allow her to marry Darzac, that he still loved her. Mademoiselle Stangerson never for one moment hesitated to confide in Monsieur Darzac. She showed him the letter in which Jean Roussel asked her to recall the first hours of their union in their beautiful and charming Louisville home. The presbytery has lost nothing of its charm, nor the garden of its brightness, he had written. The scoundrel pretended to be rich, and claimed the right of taking her back to Louisville. She had told Darzac that if her father should know of her dishonor, she would kill herself. Monsieur Darzac had sworn to silence her persecutor, even if he had to kill him. He was outwitted, and would have succumbed, had it not been for the genius of Rouletabille. Mademoiselle Stangerson was herself helpless in the hands of such a villain. She had tried to kill him when he had first threatened, and then attacked her in the yellow room. She had unfortunately failed, 
and felt herself condemned to be for ever at the mercy of this unscrupulous wretch who was continually demanding her presence at clandestine interviews. When he sent her the letter through the post office, asking her to meet him, she had refused. The result of her refusal was the tragedy of the yellow room. The second time he wrote asking for a meeting, the letter reaching her in her sick chamber, she had avoided him by sleeping with her servants. In that letter the scoundrel had warned her that since she was too ill to come to him, he would come to her, and that he would be in her chamber at a particular hour on a particular night. Knowing she had everything to fear from Ballmeyer, she had left her chamber on that night. It was then that the incident of the inexplicable gallery occurred. The third time she had determined to keep the appointment. He asked for it in the letter he had written in her own room, on the night of the incident in the gallery, which he left on her desk. In that letter he threatened to burn her father's papers if she did not meet him. It was to rescue these papers that she made up her mind to see him. She did not for one moment doubt that the wretch would carry out his threat if she persisted in avoiding him, and in that case the labors of her father's lifetime would be for ever lost. Since the meeting was thus inevitable, she resolved to see her husband and appeal to his better nature. It was for this interview that she had prepared herself on the night the keeper was killed. They did meet, and what passed between them may be imagined. He insisted that she renounce Darzac. She, on her part, affirmed her love for him. He stabbed her in his anger, determined to convict Darzac of the crime. As Larson, he could do it, and had so managed things that Darzac could never explain how he had employed the time of his absence from the chateau. Ballmeyer's precautions were most cunningly taken. Larzan threatened Darzac, as he had threatened Mathilde, with the same weapon and the same threats. He wrote Darzac urgent letters, declaring himself ready to deliver up the letters that had passed between him and his wife, and to leave them for ever if he would pay him his price. He asked Darzac to meet him for the purpose of arranging the matter, appointing the time when Larzan would be with Mademoiselle Stangerson. When Darzac went to Epinay, expecting to find Ballmeyer or Larsen there, he was met by an accomplice of Larsen's, and kept waiting until such time as the coincidence could be established. It was all done with Machiavellian cunning, but Ballmeyer had reckoned without Joseph Rouletabille. Now that the mystery of the Yellow Room has been cleared up, this is now the time to tell of Rouletabille's adventures in America. Knowing the young reporter as we do, we can understand with what acumen he had traced, step by step, the story of Mathilde Stangerson and Jean Roussel. At Philadelphia he had quickly informed himself as to Arthur William Rance. There he learned of Rance's act of devotion, and the reward he thought himself entitled to for it. A rumor of his marriage with Mademoiselle Stangerson had once found its way into the drawing-rooms of Philadelphia. He also learned of Rance's continued attentions to her, and his importunities for her hand. He had taken to drink, he had said, to drown his grief at his unrequited love. It can now be understood why Rouletabille had shown so marked a coolness of demeanor towards Rance when they met in the witness's room on the day of the trial. The strange Roussel Stangerson mystery had now been laid bare. Who was this Jean Roussel? Rouletabille had traced him from Philadelphia to Cincinnati. In Cincinnati he became acquainted with the old aunt, and had found means to open her mouth. The story of Ballmeyer's arrest threw the right light on the whole story. He visited the Presbytery, a small and pretty dwelling in the old colonial style, which had, indeed, lost nothing of its charm. Then, abandoning his pursuit of traces of Mademoiselle Stangerson, he took up those of Ballmeyer. He followed them from prison to prison, from crime to crime. Finally, as he was about leaving for Europe, he learned in New York that Ballmeyer had, five years before, embarked for France, with some valuable papers belonging to a merchant of New Orleans whom he had murdered. And yet the whole of this mystery has not been revealed. Mademoiselle Stangerson had a child by her husband, a son. The infant was born in the old aunt's house. No one knew of it. So well had the aunt managed to conceal the event. What became of that son? That is another story which, so far, I am not permitted to relate. About two months after these events, I came upon Rouletabille sitting on a bench in the Palais de Justice, looking very depressed. "'What's the matter, old man?' I asked. "'You are looking very downcast. How are your friends getting on?' "'Apart from you,' 
he said, I have no friends. I hope that Monsieur Darzac, no doubt. And Mademoiselle Stangerson, how is she? Better, much better. Then you ought not to be sad. I am sad, he said, because I am thinking of the perfume of the lady in black. The perfume of the lady in black? I have heard you often refer to it. Tell me why it troubles you. Perhaps some day. Some day, said Rouletabille, and he heaved a profound sigh. End of chapter 29 End of The Mystery of the Yellow Room by Gaston LaRue